thousands of people have mysteriously vanished in America's wilderness. Join us as we dive into the deep end of the unexplainable and try to piece together what happened. You are listening to Locations Unknown. What's up, everybody? Welcome back to another episode of Locations Unknown. I'm your co-host, Joe Irado, and with me, as always, is a guy who reminds me of you when you were your age, but only younger, Mike (laughs) Van de Bogart. Ah, Thank you, Joe, and thank you once again to all of our uh, loyal listeners for tuning in. Just a couple of quick announcements here. First, we're going to get to some Patreon shoutouts, so... Uh, thank you to Megan Timmers for supporting the show. She's the only shout out we have this week. So um, if you're listening and you're thinking about joining, just join. It's great. We're doing a Patreon episode after this. so Yes, we are. Um, if you want to call the show and leave a voicemail, you can call 208-391-6913. Anything you want to say, uh, go ahead and say it. Just remember, we may play it on a future episode. And if it's meaner or funnier or... Anything like that, we're definitely playing it. So, yes. Um, just, we, might, we might be doing voicemails right after this, yeah, actually, for our Patreon be. episode. So if you're, uh, well, this isn't live, so what I was about to say would make no sense. <laughs> <laughs> for some, what, what were you going to say? I was going to say, if you're listening right now, call and we'll we'll get your voicemail on. <laughs> yeah, if, if you're listening, just call. We'll get your voicemail yeah, on. Just tell so, everyone that so they all call. Yeah, there you go. Even though you'll be hearing this Friday. Yep, that's okay. Um, if you want to support the show, we've got many ways to do it. Obviously, you can join Patreon. Um, temporarily we, uh, we don't have YouTube memberships, but that'll be back soon. Um, do we have a date? Um, we can reapply like October. Okay. They give you 90 days to get your, get your ducks in a row. Okay. So, um, but we have, uh, on our new host Spreaker, we have Spreaker subscriptions. Um, we are in approval for X finally, um, Apple subscriptions, lots of different places you can, um, support the show we also have stores on our facebook and website uh website we're going to be revamping soon so that's exciting um what else we have um, a p.o box you could just send us envelopes of cash <laughs> yeah. that's always acceptable. Envelopes of cash. <clears throat> it's one of our favorite methods yes um uh, i want to thank erica carlson for helping yes. with the research on this one she was one of the finalists uh that is doing these episodes to uh I don't, I don't want to call it tryout, but we just wanted to get an idea for their style. Yeah. Uh, so thank you, Erica Carlson, for you. putting the episode together. And I think uh, she picked this because of our pronunciation. She always said it was really funny, and she enjoys it when we mispronounce words. So she so, picked Japan. Yeah, I think she might <laughs> secretly hate us because um, I was telling Joe before we started, I can't think of any other locations, maybe outside of the Middle East, that have harder words to pronounce. So, yeah, this will be... Uh, Interesting one, and we might lose some listeners on this one. Um, but believe us, though, when we say we, we're really trying on this one, we have the the phonetics. <laughs> like, we just don't try the other ones? <laughs> no, we try in every one of them. But No, she she included the phonetics on, on a lot so of the words, so we're going to try our best. We're going to try our best, but probably still uh, really mess <laughs> it up. But anyways, any other updates from you, Joe? No, without no. further ado. <laughs> All right, everybody, let's gear up and get out to explore locations unknown. July 24th, 1989. The police in Hokkaido, Japan, dispatched a helicopter to search the Daisetsuzen National Park to search for two lost hikers that have been reported missing. The searchers rescued the two hikers, but what brought them to their location in the first place is where the real mystery begins. Join us this week as we investigate the Mount Isihadeike SOS incident. I 
think you did a pretty good Dude, job. I, but I was I, so close to getting, I mean, I'm sure I didn't get the <clears throat> other two perfect, but I really was trying. And the last one, I think I did the phonetic opposite. Asahi. It's Asahi Dake. Or no, Asahi Dake. Asahi Dake. That's, I mean, that sounds pretty good. I, I think I said it backwards, <clears throat> but. Oh. This is going to be very <laughs> difficult for the people who don't like when we get things wrong. But we're just going to blaze through anyway. So, yeah, I mean, it's a really interesting story. So Yes. So Mount Asahidake in Daisetsusan National Park, I've got that one pretty much down, uh, is in Kamikado, or Hak- Hakado, <laughs> Hokado, Japan. Uh, it's the northernmost island of Japan. So if you think about Japan, just right off the coast of China, yeah. the big, like the big fat chunk at the top, that's like right at the center of that. Okay. So it was established uh, December 4th, 1934, and sees roughly 6 million visitors per year. Uh, we also have some real fun, interesting facts about Japan. So these are what makes these episodes kind of fun. Is yeah, You can get an idea of what the American history is going to be like, but this is something we don't normally hear about. So. Yeah. Uh, the city near Daisetsusan Park uh, and the second largest city in Hokkaido uh, is develop was developed a booming timber industry in the late 1890s. Jeez, I couldn't even read the English parts of that. I'm so thrown off by the words. <laughs> uh, by the 1920s, high demand and global recession led to over-harvesting of the trees in the area, and the Daisit Susan National Park was established in 1934 to protect the unique landscape. It's interesting. Uh, this park was created kind of out of the same reason a lot of the parks in the U.S. were created, to protect... Um, the natural habitat, and it's just kind of cool to see that happen in other parts of the world. Yeah, like it protected from encroaching industry that was just decimating. E- it. Decimating. Yeah. You know what's kind of neat though, because I'm I'm more of an optimist person. When you look at big businesses now, uh, definitely not perfect. Yeah. But the majority of them are actively starting to spend more dollars on preservation efforts. I'm sure some of them do it just for marketing. Yeah. But even if they do a little bit more than they would have just so they can market it, it's better than nothing. Well, and I think uh, more than ever now, you know, consumers have a voice. And if a company is doing something they don't like. Um, yeah, boycotting. Boycott or even yep. just like make people aware of what they're doing is enough to sometimes change a company, f- you know, especially when it comes to things about nature. Absolutely. Not, we're not going to get into any of the you know, the political stuff that's happened around, you know, the world. But when it comes to companies, like if you hear about a company dumping something in a river or, yeah, you know, anything kind of like that, it kind of shocks everybody. And once it's brought to light, you know, the company not only faces pressure from their consumers, but a lot of times face legal pressure from whatever country they're in. So yeah. it's great to see. Well, the, what's cool about the consumer side is even if they're in a country or where they can get away with it. Yeah we can still say no. Yeah. And if, as long as there's other products that like are available, people can easily shift to something else until they fix the problem or yeah. go away entirely. So no. So it's, it's cool. cool. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> that was a little tangent. <laughs> good rant. I'm just saying it's, it's a, it's a very positive direction Yeah, that we're headed. So that's good. Uh, back to the facts. The Yamato dynasty is the oldest hereditary monarch in the world. Emperor Jimu became Japan's first ruler over 2,600 years ago, and the current emperor is his direct descendant. Uh, that's pretty crazy. Yeah. You can only enter Tokyo Imperial Palace's inner grounds on January 2nd and the emperor's birthday. It's pretty cool. You forget about places like Japan and China have histories that go back thousands yes. of years. Like everyone thinks about like the Roman Empire and Greek, Greece history, you know, Greek history. And, yep. But people kind of forget that some of the oldest empires in the world came out of Japan and China. Yeah. Uh, so it's, it's kind of cool that you can trace the current uh, monarch all the way back. Yeah, like directly. Yeah. <laughs> uh, the largest city in the world by population is Tokyo, Japan. Did you know that? I didn't. I, know, I knew it was big. Yeah. I it's it was uh, big. <laughs> around 37 million inhabitants are in the greater Tokyo area. It has the highest urban population in the world. It's estimated that 11% of Japan's residents live in the city alone. 
That's a that's a wild. Japan is on my list of places I'd love to travel to. Yeah, a hundred percent. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, Japan is made up of over six thousand eight hundred islands. Uh, removing your shoes before entering a home, uh, Raikun Inn is temple uh, or temple is customary. Uh, Japan is known for its speedy bullet trains. Some bullet trains reach a speed uh, as high as 200 miles per hour, while their maglev trains can get to speeds of up to 374 miles an hour. <laughs> that was a test, too. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I don't think they're rocking that fast with people. No. Compared to uh, Amtrak here in the U.S., uh, you're lucky if you, you get up to, like, 50. Yes. <laughs> and then you stop 600 times. Yeah. Uh, it's home to the busiest pedestrian crossing in the world. Uh, it's Sh- uh, Shibuya Crossing in Tokyo. Thousands of people cross at once in all directions. That's that famous intersection you've pr- everyone's probably seen from Tokyo where it's got, it's like. Yeah, they have it in movies whenever they're trying to show bustling cities. Yeah. That's the intersection they shoot. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah, someday I want to cross that street once yes <laughs> so does everyone else that's why they uh uh it's polite to slurp your noodles mike so you'd be the most polite person there hey, there you go <laughs> i don't even know if you slurp your noodles no i don't uh slurping soba udon or ramen is not just acceptable it's considered a sign of appreciation for the dish the act of slurping enhances the flavor and helps cool down the hot broth as it enters your mouth more than that it's the Oh, wow, a pop-up slogan. It's an auditory compliment to the chef indicating that you are enjoying the meal. Did not know that. Yeah, me neither. Uh, let's see. Oh, here we go. Uh, now we're going to do an in-depth description of the features. I'm sorry, I lost my spot on the page. Uh, at 7,510 feet, Mount Asidako, uh, Asidake is the largest mountain or tallest mountain in a group of 20 peaks known as the Daisetsusan Volcanic Group. The peaks are arranged around the 1.2-mile-wide Ohachi Daira uh, Caldera in Daisetsusa National Park. The volcanic zone provides numerous vents and hot springs across the park, including a spring commonly used as a foot bath by visitors in the Asahadaki Loop Trail. Uh, just some, a little bit about the unique wildlife. Wildlife. Uh, Japanese pika, it's a small mam- mammal that lives on a rocky areas at high altitudes, its Japanese name, uh, Naki, Usa- Naki Usagi, means the singing rabbit. And I hear if they get struck by lightning, they become a Pikachu. <laughs> <laughs> you, it took you like a one second. Um, the Usabi Kicho is a member of the Asian swallowtail butterfly family. It has yellow semi-transparent wings and can only be found in Daisetsu-san. Our friends at the Copen Climate Classification System have deemed this area the warm, summer, humid, continental climate. Uh, temperatures of the warmest months are greater than or equal to 50 degrees Fahrenheit, and the coldest months are around 26 degrees Fahrenheit or lower. Uh, precipitation is more evenly distributed throughout the year, uh, so it's just kind of even everywhere, I guess. Yeah. And... So the average, well, we talked about average, but the warmest months are still less than 71 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's pretty cool there. It doesn't get too hot. Yeah. And you can kind of guess that it's kind of a, you know, it's surrounded by oceans and seas and yeah, it's, yeah, it's probably got a, you know, a climate similar to how high is it? Like relatively speaking, like, is it as high up oh, as latitude? Wisconsin? Yeah. Um, that I don't know. Maybe uh, I'm going to look that up in a little bit. Yeah, look that up. Get back to us. Yep. <laughs> uh, the park size, it's 875 square miles, so it's slightly smaller than Isle Royale National Park and slightly larger than Great Smoky Mountain National Park. And Isle Royale, that's Michigan. Yes. Which, for some reason, I've up never until been like there. two years ago, I didn't even know it existed. Yeah. <laughs> We're really bad at this stuff. Uh, yeah. <laughs> We're just so drawn to all the things that aren't around us. Yeah. Yeah. I We have not gone. Shay has been trying to organize a trip for like 16 years there, yeah. and it never happens. Well, it's a little, you know, you got to take a ferry with your car to get there. Um, oh, that's why. Yeah. <laughs> We're just like, oh, that's an impassable feat <clears throat> to accomplish. No, I mean, it looks really cool, and we should have done a trip there a long time ago, but maybe we'll get there soon. Yeah, we will. <clears throat> Uh, let's see. There's a trail from Mount Asa- Asahidaki to Mount Kurodake, and it's about 16.4 miles. 
It is very challenging. It's 6,800 feet of elevation gain, uh, but you can camp there. Uh, it's good for backpacking. It's not frequently traveled, uh, so you're not likely to see other hikers on the trail, and which it's is... out and back. Yeah, out not and back. Not like our last episode. episode. Was that 30,000 feet of elevation gain? Yeah, no, thank you. <laughs> for thousands of miles, though. Yeah. Uh, the types of animals that might present a danger or just in the area, there are brown bears, uh, are known to be present, but the encounters are very rare, so they're in very small numbers. Uh, the terrain is rocky, scree, slick with ice and snow, uh, and is very steep in certain parts. So, I don't know. It might not be a great place to go unless you're into, like, winter and cold, rainy camping. Yeah, because, I mean, it sounds like um, at lower elevations, it doesn't really get too hot. It's kind of rainy all year. I would imagine... Up at higher elevations, you know, 10,000 feet and up, it's, you're going to have snow a lot of the year. Yeah. Um, like if that area was slick, if that area was sitting in like the 80s, it'd be tropical and wonderful. But <laughs> yeah. Uh, so exposure, not much shade or cover. It sounds like you're on rocky scree mountains all the time. Yeah. Uh, and weather, the conditions can change quickly. So snow and ice may be encountered at any time of the year. Yeah. There you go. That's wild. So in general, uh, it's considered challenging. There are some loose rocks, steep sections, and can pose falling hazards, especially when descending. Um, obviously, winter conditions increase the fall risk. High winds and snow on icy paths. So they recommend hiking poles, boots uh, are strongly recommended year-round, and spikes as well in the winter's month. Uh, visitors are reminded to double-check the mountain conditions before they leave. It should be noted the weather is unsetting can change rapidly. This is how they warn people on the tourism website. So that's like the best case of yeah. what you should do because they're not going to make it sound too crazy, probably. No. <clears throat> so um, let's get into the character character profile. Did you? I, I can't wait till you say the, the, his name. Um, so uh, the name of the character here is uh, Kenjai Imwaru Imwara. He was a male. Uh, I think you got it pretty good, actually. Age uh, at the time of his disappearance was 25. He would be 65 years old now. He had black hair. Um, unfortunately, there was not much more reported about this individual at the time. Obviously, for, for one reason, it was from it happened in the 80s. And uh, being that we are not, uh, you know, being that we're, you know, from a foreign country reporting on this, there may be more information. Um, in Japan on this case, but uh, we haven't found it. And a lot of the episodes or a lot of the uh, articles on this case really focused on the circumstances of the investigation, not the individual. Well, so. and I mean, maybe their government didn't keep records like ours did. I think we're used to getting a lot of documentation, whereas we don't know in other countries, maybe they're just like, maybe he didn't even know, like people don't even know is missing ever. Yeah, and maybe it's a, a factor of, obviously, the United States probably has more uh, national parks than, you know, by, square, you know, square mile than probably any other country in the world. Um, and just by nature of that, a lot more people probably go missing here in the U.S. So by just sheer volume of missing people, maybe, I'm, I'm just speculating, but maybe the data collection and you know everything around a missing person has just evolved quicker here just because so many people go missing. Oh, okay. Um, I was wondering where you're going with that. Yeah. It took you a really long time to I land know. that plane. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> but that's, I mean, and like I said, it might be because, you know, we don't speak Japanese and we're not in Japan. There might be more information on this case that we're just not able oh, to Oh, that like to never access. got translated over. Perhaps. Yeah, we're only as good as the people who pick the story up here. Yeah. So uh, until we can hire translators. Yeah. So um, timeline really starts when. So there's a couple things going on in this timeline. So um, it starts in July 10th of 1984 when uh, Kenjai goes missing. So he had told a lodge owner um, where he was staying that he'd be hiking to the summit of uh, Asaka. How'd you say it? Asahidaki. Asahidaki. Yep. Um, the day that Kenjai was scheduled to check out of the lodge, he never showed up, and the lodge owner alerted the authorities. So authorities did perform a search, but they didn't find any trace of him at that time. 
and he remained missing for the next five years. So, so this was a, a missing person that they kind of gave up on five years prior to the story. Correct. Okay. So, you know, fast forward now to July 24th of 1989. And so police launched a search and rescue effort after two hikers, uh, identities were unknown and they were unrelated to Kenjai. Um, when they were reported missing near Mount Asahi, De- <laughs> Asahi Dick, <laughs> Asahi Dick, De- oh jeez, Asahi Dake. <laughs> okay, so they were reported missing near Mount As- Asahi Dake uh, in the national park near H- uh, H- Hokkaido, Japan. See, it was difficult to do the first part. Yeah. Um, so. We apologize to the listeners again. We're trying our best here. Uh, So the two men were from Tokyo, and they were hiking on the path from Mount Kuradoke to Mount Asahidake when they became lost. While performing an aerial search, uh, a large SOS sign was noticed by rescue officials fashioned out of large birch trees. After uh, After landing and searching the surrounding area, the two hikers were located about two miles north of the birch tree, SOS signal. After being evacuated from the park, the hikers were hungry, dehydrated, and exhausted, but okay. Rescuers remarked that they would never have found the hikers had it not been for the SOS sign they created. Now here's the twist in the story. The two hikers were confused and did not know what the rescuers were referring to. They did not make the sign, and uh, the fact that they were located near the sign and rescued because of it was pure coincidence. Police were now alarmed that there were there was another person or potentially multiple people in the area that needed rescue. That is completely wild. Yeah. I mean, what are the odds that they got lost near someone else's help sign for being lost? And how long was this sign there? Because it's made out of trees. It's not like it was like a small sign made out of rocks. Like, if you look at the picture, it looks like... Yeah, this is like a shot from an airplane or a helicopter. Those, those trees look probably what... Eight ten feet long at least, each like piece of a letter. Yeah. So I mean, how long was that there? We don't know, yeah. and and we never really do find out how long the sign was there. You got to imagine, I guess maybe they aren't flying. You know, like in U.S. national parks, a lot of parks have aerial tours. Yeah, I'll just do flyovers and in general, like surveying and animals and things like a, that. You know, any of the big parks, there's probably multiple searches every year that require helicopters. Yeah, so you would probably would stumble across it. Yeah, but maybe this park, you know, maybe it was more rare to have, you know, a helicopter in a search. I don't know. Well, at least for five years. Yeah, <laughs> so because I believe they did use helicopters in the initial search for him, from what I gathered, and they didn't find anything. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's now July 25th of 1989. So uh, a follow-up search and rescue operation um, began... In, in the same area. So the SOS was about 2.5 miles from the summit of Mount Asahidake, and the police searched the entire area with ground, air and ground uh, resources. Uh, as a result of the search, the police found several pieces of evidence near the SOS sign. So in a hole near the SOS, under the roots of a tree, searchers found an abandoned backpack. In the bag were various items, including four cassette tapes, a tape recorder, uh, and some sources called it a, a Walkman. So... The younger generation, yeah. uh, Walkman used to be basically an iPod, which is now an iPhone. An so. iPod that can only play like seven <laughs> songs at a time <laughs> Yeah, until you just switch out the hard drive with another seven songs. No, uh, you'd switch out tape. <laughs> I know. I'm calling it a hard oh, drive. Hard drive. Yeah. Trying to just so <laughs> trying to like make it more relevant. <laughs> if you, yeah. So a Walkman. That's... Technically, I think a tape is a form of hard drive or no, it's not a hard drive, but it's. I don't like know. the same concept. It stores data. It stores it's just data. on tape instead of a disc. Yes. So for, the, for those younger listeners, uh, yeah. yeah, a Walkman was basically a, a, an iPod or an iPhone. So they also found some jewelry, a tripod, a pair of men's basketball shoes, two cameras, and a notebook. There was also a human skull found alongside the bag and a driver's license belonging to none other than our 25-year-old male, Kenjai. Um, so... The tape recorder uh, contained a recording of a male voice crying for help. SOS, help me. I can't move on the cliff. SOS, help me. The places where I first met the helicopter, 
the saza, which is a type of bamboo plant, is deep and you can't go up. Lift me up from here. So, um, I do have the audio. Oh, let's hear it. That's like terrifying. That is terrifying. Um, So upon further search of the area, several additional human bones were found with animal bite marks uh, post-mortem and some evidence of being broken prior to death of the person, possibly as a result of a fall. Initially, after examination, the bones were reported to be those of a female aged 20 to 40 years and were also potentially the bones from more than one person, meaning more than one set of remains was found at the site. These bones would later be re-examined and publicly determined to be from a single male person. On September 20th of 1987, uh, so we are going, we're going back in time a little bit. So, um, so J- Japanese forest, J- Japan Forestry Agency and the Japan Ge- Geographical Authority agencies looked at old topographic map data and found aerial photographs that confirmed the SOS sign had been on the mountainside since at least twentieth uh, September twentieth of nineteen eighty seven, perhaps earlier. So we got oh, an answer geez. there. So he went missing initially. What did we say nineteen eighty four? Yeah. 1984, so they think the SOS sign was there from at least September of 1987, maybe earlier. So it sounds like, I mean, well, we'll get in theory. So um, final piece of the timeline here, February 28th of 1990, police announced upon reexamination, the bones are actually that of a male, not a female, and belong to a single person. So... um, I think it was official as of the nineties, 1990. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> so a uh, quick timeline here. So we'll get into kind of official theories and then Joe and I will uh, ruminate you with what we think. <laughs> so what does law enforcement think happened? So law enforcement closed the case after compiling all of the evidence that Kenji was in the area of the mountain had been reported missing years before and after the bones were determined to be that of a male. So you can see evidence kind of strongly suggesting that it's him, but they don't have confirmation. They believe he was hiking on or around Mount Asakideke. Uh, No confirmed reports of what his itinerary was. He got lost and ended up in it in the swampy and tall bamboo forest at the base of the mountain. After several days in the forest, Kenji managed to make it to the clearing, possibly falling and injuring himself, which would explain the bone fractures found in the remains. After seeing a helicopter flying overhead, referenced in the audio recording, he decided to build a large SOS signal to get the attention of any other helicopters that might enter the area. In desperation, he recorded the audio message. No official speculation exists on why he would record the message if he was alone and couldn't send the message out to someone. They think that he eventually succumbed to the elements and his body and belongings were discovered five years later in 1989 after the two hikers went missing and search and rescue was dispatched for them. There is no official report on the case and no official cause of death has been released. So that's the official law enforcement explanation. Okay. So here's what family thinks might have happened. So there was no official statement from family or friends The parents of Kenji stated to police that they do not think the recording sounds like his voice, and they do not believe he made the recording, which leads them to believe he was not hiking alone. A friend of Kenji stated in an interview that the basketball shoes discovered were the same size that he wore, and three of the cassette tapes contained music that matched his musical taste at the time. So now you have a theory that maybe he wasn't hiking alone. Yeah, and if... I mean, the musical doesn't mean anything because if he's hiking with a friend, yeah. your friend's going to have similar musical taste, probably. Yeah. So. Uh, but, you know, it, it it's just, a you know, the family theory. So. Well, that's what I'm saying. I think that lends credence to him not hiking alone. Yeah. Like, okay, just because the tape match. But if they're saying that's not his voice. Yeah. And, well, you have kids now. Yep. You'd be able to tell your kid's voice. Probably. Yeah. I mean, now... 
would you be able to tell the voice on an old Walkman? I think I would. You still would be. I, if it was I staticky and and they were yelling. But what yes, if as, like as an adult, like your kid was an adult. Yeah, I think so. I think so. And th- I'm speculating now. Yeah, but I. You know why I think so? Because we have tons of home movies of our kids growing up. Yeah. And I can always tell who's who if I'm not even looking at the screen. Okay. And little kids are always yelling on yeah. video. So I just am going to jump in and say I assume that I would be able to. So then in, if you think think that, then the, that might give credence to the family's theory that they don't think that's him in the audio recording. Yes, that's kind of what I'm thinking. I'm like, yeah. cause there's, and that's where I thought maybe they said, oh, the cassette tapes contain music that matches taste. Yeah. That doesn't really mean anything to me because if you're with a friend, like they probably listen to similar music. And yeah. if you're taking tapes, you're going to bring tapes along on the hiking trip that you both enjoy. Yeah. Right? So, okay, anyway. Yeah. Um, so media opinions on the matter. So... Uh, media and the public did not accept the police ex- the police's explanation. The main discrepancy commonly pointed out is most people do not believe he would have been capable of building the SOS sign. It was constructed from 19 birch tree logs. Each letter was 16 feet by 10 feet. Uh, the logs were all about the same length and appeared to be cut with an axe or some other cutting tool. Uh, the SOS was also several hundred feet away from where the birch trees grew. It did not make sense that he would have had the energy or tools to cut down 19 trees and drag them several hundred feet away into a clearing to create the sign. He was likely starving and dehydrated and possibly injured with broken bones. This feat would be difficult for a healthy and fit person and would be basically impossible for Henja in his condition. Also, no axe or cutting tool was ever found anywhere near the sign or with his belongings. Police did not answer these questions, and the public started to speculate that perhaps he was not alone. He would have had help with the sign, and this would also explain why his family said the recording did not sound like his voice. Also, originally, the bones were identified as a woman or potentially multiple people. Um, then suddenly the, they re-examine the bones and now they are a single male, a convenient match. Some think this was pure fabrication by police to wrap up a sensational case. The case is considered closed by the police, but is, uh, considered possible by the public and media that Kenji's body never really was found. And the SOS sign was built by a different party that had also gone missing on the mountain at some point within the same time period as Kenji and the two other rescued hikers. So, got a lot going on there. Yeah, it's a <clears throat> government cover-up conspiracy. I mean, I don't think it's a conspiracy in the sense, like, it's probably, I get why maybe the police were just like, ooh, this thing's spiraling out of control. Let's just say the bones are a single male and just end it there. Well, I mean, it's that's a conspiracy. <laughs> yeah, it's a conspiracy, <laughs> but it's not like, like they're hiding something like aliens or something. It's just... Well, a conspiracy doesn't have to be aliens. It's the government hiding a thing from the people to make them think a certain thing. Okay. I mean, it, by yeah. the definition, I think of like X-Files conspiracies. Like yeah. Little Green Man and, you know, guys. Or like a lot of people dying in one place <laughs> and the government covering it up. Okay, fine. To make Fair the enough. numbers better. Yeah. So maybe there were several <laughs> groups of hikers that went missing in this at the same time and the bones were of multiple people and yep. including the subject of this case and uh, they just, they didn't want to put the effort in to really investigate a case like that. Yeah. It's just a lot easier saying it was one dude. Um, so I think that's, I think that's very possible. So questions that remain about this case, if he did not build the sign who did, are there more hikers missing in the mountains um, that have perished and have yet to be found? Uh, what's going on with the c- recording? Was it him that recorded it and leave it behind as a clue t- as to what happened? Um, um, if that's the case, why does it sound like a distress call? Is it a coincidence that they say SOS in the recording and the large SOS was built? Or is this confirmation that the recording and the sign builder are the same person or party? I, and then finally, you know, obviously DNA testing was in its infancy back at this time. If would it be possible to take the bones if they were still they probably don't have the remains still, but would it be possible to take those remains now and retest them 
and get, you know, maybe find some close relatives of him, take, you know, DNA samples from them, then take a DNA sample from the bones and confirm if it's him or not. I, I, I imagine if the remains were still existing today and preserved properly, you probably could do that. But my guess is the remains have been buried or destroyed. I'm sure they're not in existence anymore. Especially if they're trying to cover it up. <laughs> yeah. So just saying. Um, so going into our theories. So most explainable, most logical. He built the sign left the recording and the bones do belong to him. Um, All of the speculation could be unwarranted. He, you know, somehow, you know, people, if they've got a motivation to live, can find strength to do, you know, if they set their mind to something like, I need to get this sign built or I'm going to die, you can find the strength and construct a sign. You know, who knows, maybe there were enough fallen trees that he was able to drag them out there, you know, birch, if I, you know, a half rotten birch log would be kind of, you know, lighter to drag. And if you've got a lot of them fallen in the forest, maybe he found enough trees to drag out there. Um, and maybe it was just him and no other parties involved. Uh, the craziest theory, um, there was additional parties out there at the same time that got lost. And... Maybe they found his belongings after he already died and recorded the message and were able to construct the sign. Maybe the party found Kenjai, <laughs> ate him for strength to build the sign and then perished anyway. So that's <laughs> almost off the deep end. Um, yeah. And kind of actual off the deep end, um, major government cover up. Obviously, aliens are. Being I like he said actual off the deep end. <laughs> yeah. Not some other party found him and ate him. Yeah. Um, so I think, honestly, I think whatever happened to him was accidental. I don't think uh, he was murdered. Japan is one of the safest countries in the world. Um, I saw a stat when I was researching interesting facts about Japan. There's actually more police officers than petty criminals in Japan. Oh, wow. It's, it's, you think that would end in like in a police state? No, it's just it's it's just a really safe country compared to I mean definitely compared to the United States, um, and it's yeah it's uh, cr- you know murder is rare in Japan. So for it's rare in a, a city like Tokyo, you know, thirty seven million people. So for yeah, that is to get pretty wild. Murdered up on a remote mountain It'd be seems. A- so incredibly unlikely. Unless <laughs> there's tons of murder, it's just and it's a huge conspiracy government cover. Well, there up. you go. That's that's more off the deep end. This is like the most public one that went out, only because they didn't think it was at first. I think it's a mix of two things. I think it sounds like this is a pretty tough place to hike. Yeah, um, I'm guessing he got lost. He probably was. Well, alive. I need to find different areas of the park because. From these pictures that I've been looking at, there's like nowhere you could could hide. Yeah. So, but this is just the one mountain. It'd be nice if we could find that like hole he fell in or they found his stuff in. Yeah. Um, but no, so I think based on the terrain and we don't know his experience out there, we don't know what gear he had. We do know that the weather, that can be ice and snow year round near the peak yeah. summit. My guess is... Oh, yeah, there's some more treat areas. I can start seeing just some of the photos. Yeah. I think it's, like I said, it's a multiple of things going on. So I think I think he probably was hiking alone, but I think there were other parties up there that also got lost in that same five-year time period. Okay. And multiple people passed away on the mountain, and when they did the search for the two missing hikers five years later and they started finding all these bones... They initially probably thought, oh, it's probably this guy that went missing, and they started testing him, and they're like, oh, crap. <laughs> this is this is multiple people that we didn't even know about were missing and have died up here. Or, you know, something even more sinister is going on. Maybe, you know, some you know a, a gang is murdering people and dumping them up there or some, whatever it is. I think after they got the initial results back, 
they're like, okay, well, we need to squash this right now. You know, they redid the DNA testing a few years later, and then magically it was all the bones were just one guy's bones. I tend to believe the DNA test the first time was the correct one that found multiple bones from multiple people. I think that's, I agree. So I think it's a combination of, I think he just had an accident and maybe he survived for a bit of time up there and uh, perished somehow. And maybe he was like trying to live in that little hole or wherever they found his belongings in. And he was living down there and perished. Maybe he had an injury that wasn't super serious, but over time was enough to kill him. Mm Mm-hmm. And then maybe there was another party of multiple people up there that built the SOS sign because apparently they didn't notice the sign up there for years um, until they went back and looked for those two hikers. So, and it does seem, you know, even it, it would be a feat for one person possibly injured to with no food and little water to drag all those trees and, you know, construct a sign. I'm not saying you couldn't do it, but um, what do you think? Oh, let's see. I've been all over the place. <laughs> yeah. You just kept going on the list and I was just like, she kept changing my mind. <laughs> um, I am legitimately leaning towards some sort of government cover up. I'd say not at a level of like craziness, more of a level of convenience, kind of what you were saying initially Yeah. of this is way bigger than what we want to deal with. Um, and this is, this is pure speculation, but the Japanese are very conscious of what they do and how they look like, like how they, how they're perceived. Okay. So it could be something like that. If you have an unsolved case, it's not perfection. Like you, you need to be able to solve these. Yeah. And in that instance, maybe it's just, this was one person. We're not going to dig any deeper. It's We have this recording. This person went missing this date. It's definitely that person case closed. Okay. Uh, just to maintain that. But then the other side of me says, okay, they live that life for perfection. Well, how do you actually get there? You have to be perfect. Yeah. So oh, I forget who it, cause I really like Dan Carlin's, uh, podcast, hardcore history. Okay. Yeah. And he talks very <clears throat> highly of the Japanese culture and just saying everything there is pristine and perfect. And he, he says he's been there a bunch of times. He's fascinated by their culture and who they are as a people. And they said, oh, he said, "You how you think about it is you think you have a nice garden? Go see a Japanese person's garden. Yeah. Oh, you think you do this well? Well, go look at the equivalent person who does that same thing in Japan. Yeah. It's, and what was the statement he made? He said, oh, I remember it. He said, the Japanese people are just like everybody else, but only more so. <laughs> That's kind of how I put it. And he's like, yeah. every aspect of everything they do will put everyone else to shame just because yeah. that's like almost deep rooted in their culture. If they're going to do something, they're not only going to do it, it's going to be to perfection. Yeah. And they really are hard on themselves if it's not. Like it's serious. So in that same vein then, it, that that's where I go drive, back and forth because well, then sweeping for, it on the rug is not perfect. Well, so here's maybe that drive to perfection led to the conspiracy to hide because... They realized to maintain the perfection. Well, no, they they realized all of these people went missing and died, and they didn't know about it. I didn't even think about that part. So, of it. so it's like double imperfection. Well, no, so like maybe in their eyes, if what you're saying is correct about the culture in Japan, so perfection would be if anyone goes missing up there, we know about it. We either get them out or we get the remains out. We cannot have, you know three, four people just go missing. We never know about it. And then five years later, we accidentally find their remains when we searched for two other missing people. Like that's just completely unacceptable. That's kind of what I'm thinking. And because of that, we're going to say it was all bones related to the one guy that we knew was missing. Yeah. So that is how I could see a conspiracy happening because you would think like if they're truly perfection, you wouldn't want to commit a conspiracy against something like this because that's not, you know, you're not being... Well, and that's the weird thing too then. We don't know how many people. No. What if it's a bunch? And if it's a a bunch, is it a whole hiking party? Or is it a bunch of different people from different times? And then if so, why are they all in the same area? 
Yeah. Why are all their bones in one spot? And I mean, are any are any of them foreigners? I, or, I'm just saying yeah. it doesn't matter. Well, I think it would be no, more I'm ta- of a scandal if it was like... If, no, I'm talking about that means somebody else is involved who's putting them there. Oh, that's why I said the conspiracy, like maybe a gang is murdering people and dumping them. That's there. kind of what I'm wondering too. Or not a gang, what if there's a serial killer that is going after hikers in the mountains and like only getting them on this specific trail in this specific area where you can dump the body? Well, and, I think we won't ever know because they never really tested to see how many different people the bones made up. Yeah. I, that's why I think the first DNA test, even though it was, might have been primitive compared to tests we do now, was probably the true and correct one because it identified that they thought there was multiple bo- you know, bones from multiple people there. So, yeah, know. interesting case. Um, right? Yeah, thank you, Erica, for uh, picking one of the hardest locations on the planet for us to pronounce. <laughs> <laughs> I do feel like we've done better than, like, episodes when we're talking about anything going on in the Southwest. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, I think this one's kind of puzzling. Uh, I think we'll never know because what, what's your final final. Cause you said like 7,000 theories. Huh. I think it's a mix. Like I said, a mix of he legitimately was hiking by himself, got injured, perhaps l- lived long enough up there for a couple days, a week or whatever it was found shelter in that hole passed away and then another group of hikers got lost built the sos sign then also died in the same spot in the same area maybe that they found that same they found the bones together yeah maybe they found that hole that maybe he tried to take shelter and they thought the same thing and then they passed away there too and Mm. that's why all the bones were found and maybe someone from that other party found the walk maybe he had the walkman on him the people in the other party found it left the sos message and then um, multiple people built that SOS sign. Yeah. Because that would be tough for one guy to build. I don't know. If it's if dead logs, maybe not. Maybe not. But even if he's injured, I mean, we don't know the extent. We don't. It sounded like some of the bones had injuries before they died. Yeah. Fractures. And it'd be tough to, you know, drag those things if you had fractured legs or. Um, so, yeah, I think it's a mix. I think the law enforcement probably realized they didn't know about a bunch of other missing people that died up there and then covered it up because it would look too embarrassing to admit, Oh yeah, there were five other people that went missing and died and we had no clue. Like didn't don't even know who they are. Like, I don't even know how that would happen. Yeah. I mean, aren't there families looking for other people that are missing? Like, I mean, who we don't know. Yep. So that's my theory. I don't even know. <laughs> I don't. I think each one is plausible. I I think the most, well, if you're going to make it clean, the most clean theory is it's one person's bones. He got stuck there. That's it. Yeah. And that was his SOS. And they only found it because the other, the other two, that's the most logical, but I don't believe that. I think there's some sort of cover up. I don't think there's like a serial killer. No, I I think it might've been more than one person. Maybe he was with a group of people. I think they're just covering up their own incompetence by, not knowing not who the other ones are. Knowing a bunch of other people went missing and died. Yep. <laughs> nope. I agree with you. Yeah. Well, uh, we want you guys to share your uh, opinions. So you can call the number. You can leave it on social media. Do whatever you want. But thanks again for tuning into our show. We appreciate you all for listening and sharing locations unknown with your friends and family. Be sure to like and follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and YouTube where you can see all of our videos and maybe sign up sometime late in October. Also, if you would like to support the show monetarily, please visit our website or Facebook store to buy our sweet, sweet swag. And you can always do those subscriptions uh, to Patreon and all the other subscription areas uh, that helps us monthly, and you get access to specific exclusive content. And lastly, when you're enjoying the beauty of nature, whether backpacking, camping, or simply taking a walk, always remember to leave no trace. Thanks, and we will see you all next time.